Okay, so you know when someone says something that catches you completely off guard and you don't respond the way you want and afterwards you kind of practice what you should have said over and over and over in your head? Well, that happened to me right after the last presidential election. I was at a parent meeting and a mom, I'll call her that mom, was worried that students who supported the quote unquote alt-right didn't feel their views were welcome at the school. That mom literally said, I know this is bolder, but you can't take sides in a public school. There are two sides to every story. What about the racists? Don't they deserve to have their voices heard? As a Latina from an immigrant family who studies race, education, and dialogue across difference, I should have had a ready, articulate response to that most hideous of questions. What about the racists? But I didn't. Instead, I think I made a face, changed the subject. <laughs> so today, I want to try to answer that mom, as well as those who want to protect violent, bigoted views in the name of free speech. I'll share why I believe that no, actually, the racists don't deserve a public hearing in educational institutions. In my view, there's been a lot of confusion lately about just what viewpoints actually merit debate in classrooms and campus forums, and what we really mean when we talk about free speech. When teachers hear reasonable disagreements about contested issues like, say, affirmative action or even football, of course they should consider multiple, multiple sides and diverse viewpoints. In fact, colleges often rightly subscribe to the notion that they're a marketplace of ideas. But must educators always offer balanced perspectives so that students can hear the other side? What about when one side is simply wrong? What would happen if someone with a clearly unreasonable view asked to speak at CU? Say, Richard Spencer, the head of the self-proclaimed alt-right white nationalist movement, which could rightly be called a Nazi movement. A debate about free speech would likely ensue, with some arguing that he'd be allowed to speak on campus regardless of his views because the law requires it. According to current US law, hate speech is protected speech, after all. However, Purposeful incitement to violence that is likely to lead to imminent lawless action is not. And in schools, there can be limits on speech that disrupts the work of the schools and the rights of other students. So from an ethics perspective, we could justify not allowing a public figure like Richard Spencer to speak on campus as someone with avowedly racist, white supremacist views that go well beyond being merely unpopular, well beyond being controversial, well beyond being offensive. But the Spencer example is maybe too obvious. What if someone less obviously wrong wants to speak? Recently, Charles Murray and Milo Yiannopoulos have come to speak at CU. The university's leaders have done a good job handling these controversial viewpoints. If they're going to allow them, I think CU's strategy of ignore and counter program has worked well to diffuse tempers and minimize the attention that these speakers are after. But the larger ethical question remains, should campus leaders have allowed those speakers? So let's consider the Yiannopoulos case. The then Breitbart writer gave a lecture at CU sponsored by the campus chapter of Turning Point USA. Turning Point is an organization that is, quote, dedicated to documenting and exposing college professors who promote anti-American values and advanced leftist propaganda in the classroom, end quote. 
To further this agenda, they often bring downright hateful speakers to campuses across the country. Yiannopoulos is known, on the one hand, for political theater, humor, and outrageous shenanigans, but on the other, for Islamophobic, sexist, homophobic, and transphobic views. In fact, he regularly singles out specific individuals for intimidation and ridicule on the campuses at which he speaks. At West Virginia University, for example, he called out Professor Daniel Brewster by name, displaying the professor's picture and labeling him not only as fat, but also with a profanely disparaging label of his sexual orientation. At the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, he outed a transgender student, denying her existence and putting her at risk. I could go on, but the point is that a university leader could have moral justification to limit the campus platform for views like Yiannopoulos's that are false or violent, especially to historically marginalized people. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm making a distinction between controversial views and unreasonable views. Unreasonable views are incorrect, untrue, and unconscionable. The problem is that they're being allowed a campus platform as if they are just as worthy as views we know to be true. After the Charlottesville tragedy, disagreements like these have taken on a deeper significance as we in education try to navigate increasingly polarized context for teaching, learning, and research. So the question arises, how can we create inclusive, nonviolent spaces for democratic education in which controversial issues can be deliberated while at the same time people's dignity is upheld? Now I'm a philosopher, so let me do what we do best. I'll offer a conceptual framework to help us understand and answer that question. OK, so the framework focuses on three evaluative principles that I'm calling the three R's. My three R's, which by the way, I'll actually start with the letter R, which is good. <laughs> they represent the three central principles that taken together can help us evaluate controversial views. They are relationship, reciprocity, and reasonableness. So first, relationship. Now, of course, we all know how important this is for teachers and learners. It underscores that we need to pay attention to how classroom discussions and campus forums about race or about gender and sexuality or about immigration, for example, may land differently on members of marginalized populations. So a focus on relationship allows us to center our common humanity and our dignity and to prioritize each other as people, from the student with limited cultural awareness who might say something offensive in class to the student who might be frustrated or harmed by their classmates' lack of knowledge. The central, second central principle is reciprocity which is based on an ideal of mutual respect. Reciprocity requires people to justify to others the reasons for their political decisions in mutually acceptable terms. This is what makes it possible to build continuing relationships. The success of a deliberative democracy depends on the idea of reciprocity to foster dialogues that are respectful and inclusive and that encourage deeper understanding of the content of moral and political disagreements. And third, reasonableness. This principle helps us discern which views are beyond the pale, are untrue or wrong. That is, which views are indefensible and thus do not merit public airing on campus. Prioritizing reasonableness in our discourse underscores that what is right is more important than so-called balanced perspectives. There are not two sides to every story when one of those sides is a lie. 
Focusing on reasonableness in education settings allows us to be able to take a stand against lies, violence, and intimidation, against racism and other isms as well, and against the unreflective relativism of treating any old view as if it were equally worthy of consideration and discussion. These three R's can serve as guideposts for decision making during turbulent, divided times. My argument here is not about pushing political correctness or avoiding hurting people's feelings. It's not about banning offensive speech or even hate speech. It is about knowledge, the central pillar of a university, what is true and what is right. We know that Nazis are wrong. We know that LGBTQ people exist. We know that racism and white supremacy are untenable. If we in education can't take a stand for what we know to be scientifically true and ethically right, then who can? That's what I wish I had said to that mom. <laughs> Thank you.